Drawing is the basis of all plastic arts because, through it, you learn the necessary skill related to proportions. With the practice of drawing, you also learn to see the tones and edges that are so important in painting. For this purpose, I recommend that you often carry a sketchbook and a pencil or charcoal with you. Draw anything that is in front of your eyes. Practice as much as you can. This way, you will feel quite confident in deciding to paint your own face. Painting the human face is the greatest challenge for any artist as the painting is expected, not only to look like the model but to be a true work of art. When the artist is in the process of painting something, he does not think that he is painting a tree, a fruit, a rock, an eye or a nose. You don't learn to paint things, you learn to paint, period. The painter paints things first, the artist paints paint first. The artist only thinks about the shape, that is, its proportions, tones or values, hues and edges. This language of painting forces you to think in an abstract way, especially if you want to paint a portrait or a figure. In this sense, one of the greatest difficulties the art student faces is that he must change his way of seeing things. Although in order to paint, it is very important to know how to draw with some skill, there is a great difference between drawing and painting. In drawing, the line made by the pencil or charcoal predominates. In painting, the mass made by the brush predominates. For these reasons, the jump from drawing to painting can cause some difficulty. Many students start by drawing the model with lines. Then they try to cover this drawing with paint without disturbing the drawing that they have so carefully made without realizing the difference between the two approaches. Also, since they are not used to seeing color, they only see different tones of the same color hue in the model. They cannot paint the different hues on the model's face because they cannot see them. Their work may end up as a colored drawing, of a boring monochromatic hue without the richness of the colors it should have. The student feels insecure, without being able to see the colors in the objects or models in front of him. Eventually the student gets stuck in his learning. But, with some guidance and practice, you can go a long way. Let's rethink our approach in terms of the tone or value that, as I have repeated so many times, is the most important. In order to progress, a certain simplification of the process is required by segregating the painting into patterns of light and shadow. This massing should be as simple as possible. As I have shown previously, the first masses in a painting should be the shadows attached to any other dark area be it the background or any other dark object. It is very important to remember that this initial approach should be the starting point when painting anything.
Many students, when they begin to paint this face, first think of a line drawing without realizing that it tends to tie up and limit their painting, by having to avoid disturbing or distorting the drawing in the process. Why draw details that will later be covered with paint? Rather than thinking totally in linear terms, you must first combine the lines with dark masses. This method is more efficient because it follows two of the fundamentals that I have indicated previously, that is, to establish the structure of the painting in a simple way with dark masses, and to work the painting from the general to the particular, from the large areas to the details. Observe the same principles applied to the color in these other faces. I have outlined the important masses on the faces with black dividing lines for you to see them better. You must think in terms of these masses, instead of a totally linear drawing. To follow this method, you must squint your eyes, and establish the locations of the masses while keeping some proportion to the sizes and shapes of all the masses. Practice segregating the values and colors in photographs from old newspapers and magazines, with a pen or pencil. Simplify shapes, tonal masses, and colors. Try to simplify by no more than four or five values. Notice how I have simplified the values in these photographs. I made the divisions between the masses arbitrarily, but you can see that they divide the values fairly accurate. This type of exercise teaches you to simplify the areas in different values and colors. This is very important because it teaches you how you should think when looking at what you are painting, and it creates the necessary habit of seeing how an artist sees. Let's look at an example of starting the initial massing. If you want to paint a self-portrait, decide where you want your face to be divided between light and local shadow. As you turn your head towards the light, notice how the pattern of light and shadow changes. Remember, that you must be thinking of a tonal contrast like this one to establish the structure of your painting. Now, observe how drawing and painting are combined in the same action to achieve lines and masses. Using a large, number 8 or 9 brush, and a dark neutral color such as burnt umber mixed with ultramarine blue and a bit of medium, we seek to establish the overall shape of the design. You must forget about the details and think abstractly. Remember that you must squint your eyes every time you want to reduce the image to simple masses in terms of dark and light values. This is very important. Decide on the size and location of your head on the canvas considering the space around the head, the background. Divide the face into two simple dark and light masses according to the light shining on the face. For now, leave the light parts unpainted. Don't be fooled by the casual look of this initial massing. Don't confuse it with a detailed drawing. At this stage what is sought is a certain design and proportion in the appropriate place on the canvas.
Mass in the parts of your face in shadow without much attention to the value changes within these shadows. Avoid equal distribution of light and shadow. Simplify, and average all these dark values into a single dark, or medium dark value. Keep this layer of paint very thin because in a next stage, you will apply another layer with more color and less medium. It is common to see the art student fall short from how dark to make the shadow masses. Remember, that in the scale of values, these areas will be the darkest in the whole painting so, you should not make them too light. Make these dark masses with loose brush strokes and no details but, as exact as possible. You should start with the larger shapes first because, if the proportions of these are right, the smaller shapes will fall into the right place very easily. Observe this other face, how all the shadow areas are covered with the dark value of the mass, including the shape, where the eye will later be painted. A lot of contrast should be established between the mass that corresponds to the shadow, and the lighter area that corresponds to the light. After massing the shadows with the appropriate dark value, you must modify the color of the shadows. When you look at the shadows on the face you realize how confusing it can be to decide what value and color to paint them. This is so, not only because of the many values that you can see in the shadows, but the more you look at the shadows, the lighter their values appear because your pupils open to accommodate their darkness. You simplify this problem by quickly painting the mass with an average dark value. That is to say, a generalized value. The shadow should be simple. Humans observe the illuminated parts of objects much more than the shadows. We will see that it is in the light, and not in the shadow where you should show off the variations and vibrations of colors. One of the characteristics that you can observe in the shadows of the objects is that there is a certain luminosity, or transparency that is much easier to achieve with warm colors than with cool colors. In this sense, it is possible to achieve shadows with enough transparency by applying a thin layer of any warm color, be it cadmium yellow, cadmium red or mixing an orange with both of these on top of the still wet dark mass. So, you can combine the dark of the burn umber with the warm color. When sliding the brush with the warm color on top of the burnt umber, do not press the brush too hard so, as not to disturb the color underneath too much. Control brush pressure, until the desired value and color is achieved. Do not attempt any texture or modeling in the shadows as these are functions of the light colors in the light. Always keep a thin layer in the shadows. The impasto or texture with a thicker layer of paint is done in the light and not in the shadows.
When you paint the initial mass with the dark value, you must join any cast shadows to the local shadow. Both are of a dark value. You must remember that a cast shadow is created when some shape obstructs the light, creating a silhouette of it of a relatively dark value on some surface on the opposite side to the source of the light. The cast shadow is always related to the angle of the light falling on the object or model. Notice in this example, that from our point of view the light is coming from above, a little to the front, and to the left of the model. For this reason, the cast shadow of the nose lies elongated below and a little to the right of the nose. In this example, the light is practically on top of the model. For this reason, projected and elongated shadows occur not only from the nose, but from various parts of the hair and the head over more than half of the blouse. Note, the large difference in value in the blouse designs, between the lit part on the left and the shadow part on the right. Here, the light comes from the left, at an angle of almost 45 degrees, and in front of the face. In this position the cast shadow of the nose is to the right of the face, at an angle equal to that of the light. Notice, a small difference between the darker value of this cast shadow, and the not-so-dark value of the local shadow. This painting, with an almost monochromatic color palette, has the sunlight falling on top of the model, creating a cast shadow on his shoulders, from the hat he is wearing. His left arm, and the hat he is holding in his hand, create elongated shadows on the basket. The design that these projected shadows create, was my main concept, that is, what initially impressed me to make this painting. In this painting, at a subway station, my concept was the light coming from the back, creating cast shadows projected by the columns of the train station, and the people in the background. In addition, these shadows gave me the opportunity to put some impasto, thick paint, on the light on the floor to establish much value contrast. My concept in this self-portrait, was the effect of the light that enters through the window to the right on the face, and the figure. This creates multiple cast shadows with more detail, than the previous examples, but follows the same reasoning. Note, that the head and the raised arm obstruct the light, and create cast shadows on the opposite shoulder and upper chest, below the collarbone. I have warmed up the color of these shadows with orange, and red hues, at the same time made them a darker value. Almost all the edges between the light and the shadows have been kept soft. The cool greenish background balances the warmth of the skin, and easel colors. This example shows that you don't have to use a complicated color scheme to achieve harmony in a painting.
To simplify the skin colors of the model and the light, it is important that you first learn about color temperature and the comparison between cool and warm colors. Let's look at some examples of basic skin mixing that will give you an idea of what I mean. This is a graph of a mixture of white, yellow ochre, cadmium red and ultramarine blue. Notice the amounts of each of the colors in the mixes. If you add more red then the hue would be warmer. Adding even more red would make it look even warmer. On the other hand, if you add more blue to the mixture, the hue would be cooler. With a little more blue it would look even cooler. Now let's look at a skin color with a mixture of white, cadmium red, yellow ochre and alizarin crimson on this diagram. Notice, the amounts of each color. If you add more alizarin crimson then, the hue would be more purplish and cool. On the other hand, if you add more red, the hue would be redder and warmer. Keep your mixture simple with no more than three or four colors. Don't make big alterations to a mixture by adding a huge amount of some color to it. It is best to slowly approach the color you want by adding small amounts to the mix until you get the color you want. Sometimes it is best to start a new mix if it strays too far from the desired color. These have been just a few examples of skin color mixtures. The skin could be seen in practically any color so you must observe both the color of the light source and the local color of the skin to mix both cool and warm colors. In order to paint a face, we must know how to join the hues on the skin with appropriate edges and opposite temperatures. Notice the different hues and temperatures in this exercise. Observe here the warm hue above and to the left side where it is darker than a lighter toned, cool hue on the right. The high contrast is due not only to the fact that they seem to be complementary colors of low intensity but are separated by a hard edge. This drama is obtained with a hard edge between a dark and a light tone of two complementary colors. The edge becomes firm as it goes down and both, the warm hue on the left and the cool hue on the right, become a little more color intense. As the edges go further down, both warm and cool hues have been mixed in the center, creating soft edges and thus their intensities have been lowered. Yet, the warm hue prevails on the left and the cool hue prevails on the right. Lost edges are formed down, in the middle, where the two hues have been completely mixed. Here they cancel each other out creating a particular chromatic grade that could not be obtained in any other way. Practicing this exercise with other warm and cool skin hues is very helpful for your development as an artist. Here are more possibilities. You should start painting skin colors in the light simply, 
with two generalized skin hues like these examples, one warm and one cool. Let's see a sample approach to painting areas, from under the eye to above the mouth, with hues ranging from warm to cool. Observe a way to make the edge between the light and the local shadow with a light and warm hue. First, I accumulate some paint, close to the dark color of the shadow. You should limit the amount of the medium in your painting, especially in light values. I control the pressure of the brush and accumulate the paint without much medium, especially where I lighten the hue. I make brush strokes without much pressure between the light and the shadow to form a soft edge between the two. I don't let the light paint get too far into the local shadow area. The local shadow must be kept dark with the warm transparency of the cadmium color that we applied previously. I accumulate more paint, creating a certain amount of impasto or texture where the value is lightest. I keep working the edge, following the border I made with a local shadow. Notice that I go around the edge below the cheekbone. I get closer to the side of the nose, with less brush pressure, and add a mix of a little bit of blue and white to the previous mix, to make a bit cooler hue. Notice the firm edge where the cast shadow of the nose begins. I go back to work a little higher and below the eye, where I see a little more orange hue on the skin, so I first warm the mixture with a little bit of cadmium yellow and almost no red. This mix can be done on the palette, or directly on the canvas. All of these changes are quite subtle. I continue to work the edge below the cheekbone. Then, I mix a very small amount of orange color of more intensity and apply it on the edge, where the skin turns towards the shadow. A greater intensity is almost always observed in the color that lies between the light and the shadow or penumbra. I work the shape with more paint and little brush pressure. Remember that you must observe the topography of your model's face carefully, as each face is different. I see a little bit of light above and to the side of the eye, so I very carefully apply a very thin layer of the light paint in that spot over the local shadow. You can control the temperature of the hue by adding small amounts of a warm color like orange to warm it up or a cool color like ultramarine blue to cool it down. Very subtle value differences could be controlled with more or less white in the mixes, or with more or less brush pressure. I realize that the value of the hue immediately under the eye could be lighter and cooler. I add more white with a hint of blue which makes its temperature cool a bit, at the same time as its value lightens. I mix much white with a little bit of ultramarine blue and yellow ochre. I apply this cool hue above the mouth. The color below the nose is cooler than in the upper part of the face. Usually, 
This same area on a woman's face is not so cool. See an example dividing map areas in the image that shows what you should look for when looking at the skin topography. I have divided the hues into pieces of different temperatures with green lines, indicating the thinking process that you should follow. Although I explained the process, and demonstrated it in a simple way, this is very important for your development as an artist, because it is the starting point of an approach that moves away from line drawing, and will result in a painting of a still life, a landscape, a portrait or any other motif. You should fix in your mind this method of simplifying the values and colors as if they were pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. Notice the simplification I show with lines that are meant to separate some pieces of color and value. You don't necessarily have to draw these lines. I have drawn them only to show how you should think when looking at your model. You can easily mass in these areas with your brush without drawing the lines. By looking closely at a face in this way you must evaluate, and classify the values and colors of each piece of the jigsaw puzzle. Disregard any little detail you see on these pieces. Start by selecting one of the pieces, and mix the approximate corresponding color. The hue does not have to be exact, but it is important that the value of the color you select is very close to what you see, whether it is a light value, a half value or a dark value. The hue of the piece can be somewhat different but the temperature and value should be right. Apply the brush stroke, creating the shape in the right place. Seeing these pieces of the jigsaw puzzle takes some practice, but with perseverance you can do it. Eventually, you will be able to experiment by changing or exaggerating the hues that you see in each of these color masses in order to create certain color schemes that I will explain in the next lesson. After painting the pieces in place, you should observe the edges, or connections between the pieces. I mean how slowly, or fast the color, and value of one piece changes to the color and value of another adjacent piece. Look at the light-valued orange piece on the cheekbone that has a soft edge, when it meets the side of the face that has a more reddish piece. To achieve this edge, drag the brush between the two pieces of paint still wet, if you follow this method without thinking about things and only thinking about this plastic language that I have explained, I guarantee that, as if by magic you will get an image of the topography of the skin. You can see some color mixtures indicated by the green arrow. I initially covered the canvas with a cool gray of half value to get rid of the white colored canvas, this makes color and value evaluation easier. Resist the urge to paint the details, that is, very small pieces of color. These details are done when finishing the painting.
Compare the values of the map of the face done in charcoal with the painting to its right. You must do many exercises like this one to create the habit of classifying values. Practice creating these maps many times with your self-portrait until you can do it effortlessly. You should not try to understand color by itself but as a necessary solution to your concept in a specific composition. Although there is no right or wrong way to manage color, there are fundamentals to help you achieve better results. From the moment you start putting colors on canvas, you should see how the colors relate to each other. To achieve harmony of colors in a painting, you must work with a scheme that pleases our eyes and that includes warm and cool colors. The scheme you choose must relate to your concept. You don't have to let the colors of the model, landscape, or still life dictate what colors to use in your painting. These can be used as a reference to select your color scheme. The scheme must be a simple one that includes analogous colors, next to each other on the color wheel, that dominate the painting in some complementary color, opposite on the color wheel, subordinate to the dominant ones. The area that the dark values occupy should not be equal to the area that the light values occupy the canvas, following the hierarchy principle. Likewise, the dominant analogous colors should occupy a greater area of the painting than the subordinate complementary colors. In other words, your painting should be mostly warm or mostly cool. For example, if the dominant analog colors are warm like these orange, yellowish orange and yellow hues, the complementary color could be this blue-violet which is cool. The blue-violet hue would occupy a smaller area on the canvas than the dominant analog colors. In this other example, the dominant hues are the bluish-violet, violet and reddish-violet which are cool while the complementary hue is yellow which is warm. As you can see from these schemes, the complementary color does not always have to be directly opposite the central dominant analog colors on the color wheel. It is enough that it is opposite in temperature to one of the dominant color. The dominant colors could be four instead of three like those ranging from reddish-violet to orange. Notice that the red color is present in each of them. In this case the complementary could be either blue or green, which are cool colors. Now, Let's see the following color scheme applied to a specific painting. Notice the face and shirt in this painting. They are dominated by reddish and violet red analog hues, which are warm. While part of the face and the background shows a yellowish green, which is cool, complementary and subordinated to the dominant hues. In this face it is evident that the family of red and orange colors of the shown scheme dominates, while green is subordinated. In this group of teenagers, 
there is a scheme of several warm reddish dominant hues, and a subordinated blue. Find the color scheme that you like, and try to create a design into your concept. Let's think some more about the optical effect of warm colors that seem to get closer, and of cool colors that seem to move away from the observer. While painting the edges of the mangoes, and the green watermelon in part 3 of this course, remember some of their edges were painted with hues of cool temperature, so that they would move away and go back? Imagine viewing these areas, in terms of planes on their shapes. Seeing any shape in terms of the temperature of its planes, and two or three simple values is the best way to visualize the volume of a face. This type of approach goes a long way toward keeping control over what you are doing. It is easy to get confused by the different hues and shapes that you see on the face. But, if you keep your attention on the temperature and the general value of each plane, you can build a solid shape. Notice, that when the skin turns back, and away from us, its color temperature changes. If the plane lies at an angle to the light, it generally looks cooler than a plane facing the light. When you see an oblique plane with an overall cool hue, paint it with this hue first and then you can change it a bit, but without changing its color temperature. The color temperature that you see on the skin changes depending on the angle of the light. Generally, when a light hits a plane from the front, its color looks warmer than, when a light hits it from the side. Think about the topography of the face, and remember that cool colors seem to move away and warm colors seem to move closer. When a plane moves away, think of some cool color temperature, whether it is greenish, bluish or violet. When a plane is viewed from the front, think of a warm color temperature, such as reddish, orange, or yellowish. Notice, the cool hue on this plane and its warm variations, which do not change the overall color temperature, that is kept cool. As you observe the skin topography, you should select areas of different colors, and classify them as warm, or cool. You may give a certain vibration to the paint when a color of a certain temperature is applied, and then on top of it, apply hints of some other color of the opposite temperature, with a similar value. This avoids the monotony of a single hue. When doing this it is important that a particular hue predominates. In other words, you must be careful not to disturb the paint underneath too much, and not mix the colors completely with equal amounts of hues of opposite temperatures, as this would create too uniform an area. To keep some harmony, repeat colors from your color scheme. 
avoid spilling the entire rainbow on your painting. Remember, what I explained earlier. Your concept represents the limit within which you work, and which gives consistency to the structural unit of the painting. The concept is what keeps the technique in check. The skin color in the light can be of any hue depending on the local color of the person's complexion and the color temperature of the light. When you see a hue on a plane with a different temperature than the generalized color of the rest of the skin, mix it up on your palette and apply it to the particular area. Then you can create edges to join the area to adjacent hues. Don't be afraid to stray from the generalized or averaged hue which you mixed in in the beginning. Try to get rid of preconceptions that things are of a certain color. The sky is not just blue, the tree leaves are not always green, and the skin is not pink or orange all the time. Be honest, see the color, mix it up and apply it in the right place. When looking at the model keep your concept in mind. In other words, it is very important for your concept to be consistent with the color scheme that you have decided to use, and not necessarily by the specific colors that the model shows. Remember that you are not copying, or imitating the endless amount of details, colors, values and edges that you see in the model, but rather simplifying and adjusting these, to your concept and aesthetics. Oblique planes should not be completely, and evenly covered as if painting a wall. Observe the places where a cool color, be it greenish, bluish or violet, becomes more evident, and apply the brush stroke selectively. Play with the color. Observe changes in the skin topography, and use them as references for variations in value and color. This makes the painting more interesting. In the same way, observe the frontal planes and identify where the warm color is most intense, be it reddish, orange or yellowish. Observe changes in value, and color in the skin topography. These changes capture the unique character of your model and add much more quality to your paintwork. Take your time mixing the appropriate color as you see the color temperature changes. To take advantage of and maximize the plastic impression of the paint, you can apply it thicker and selectively on places where the light falls directly on the skin showing some highlights. Light areas can be painted with some impasto, or texture to give it a more impressionistic, sculptural effect. You should not do the highlights with white paint only, as pure white looks lifeless. It is possible to maintain the color harmony in your painting, even in the highlights. For the greatest effect, 
Highlights could be painted of a very light valued hue, with an opposite color temperature to the color where the highlight will be applied. Either cool over warm or warm over cool. For example, you can mix very little green, blue or violet to a much greater amount of white paint to make a highlight over a reddish, orange or yellowish skin color. Remember that, to maintain the harmony of colors in your painting, you must follow a color scheme. Harmony is kept by repeating dominant analogous colors. Too many colors from many parts of the color wheel in your painting would lack harmony, therefore producing stridency. In other words, the parts of the painting would not keep a consistent structural unit. Of all the details of the face, the eyes attract the most attention. These, like other facial features, should be painted after the general shape of the head and its place on the canvas have been established. The eyes should be painted as forms joined to neighboring forms, never isolated. I suggest this sequence as a way to simplify the process of painting the eye. Start with thin layers of dark valued masses including the entire eye socket from the brow to below the eye. Notice the shape of this particular eye a bit diamond like in the straight, diagonal line of the brow. Pay attention to particular shapes. Keep working with thin, dark valued paint. Paint the iris of the eye and part of the side of the nose. Pay close attention to the general shape of the eye. Look for the dark, half-value areas, and begin to paint the general skin color. Note, that it is easier to work from dark values to the lighter values. Repeat colors that you have used in other areas of the face. Keep working towards the lighter valued hues. You can mix the hue of the whites of the eyes, with a little skin color and white, or mix white with two complementary colors, to achieve a low intensity light color. Do not use white only. Paint the edges, where hues and values meet. Finish by subtly painting in some highlights, and perhaps suggesting some lashes. You can use a pointed object, like the handle of the brush to pick up a little bit of light valued paint, and paint the highlight of the eyes. All eyes are different. When you are painting the eyes see their shapes as if you were seeing them for the first time. Don't assume that any area must be light or dark. Take a close look at each area, mix the hue with its corresponding value and intensity, and cover the area with the mixed paint. Use the brush at the correct angle and pressure, to achieve the proper shape. The eyes are attached all around them with other shapes that should also be considered. All adjacent topography is important. Notice all the changes in hues, values, and intensities that are in and out of the eye socket. Don't be in a rush when it comes to painting these details.
I emphasize the dark values of the shadows, as these represent the structure of the painting. Don't lose sight of this function. Keep these dark values on the warm side of the color wheel for two main reasons. One reason is, for shadows to look chromatic. If you were to paint these with black, gray or opaque colors only, they would not look natural. And the second reason is, so that the shadows look transparent. This is mostly achieved with colors like cadmium colors. You should remember how, at the beginning of this course, I indicated that oil paint colors are either transparent or opaque. Since cool colors recede, I mix a cool, low-intensity, half-value hue, where green predominates, to paint the area farthest from the nose, between the two eyes, and higher between the two eyebrows. This green hue is one of the dominant analog colors in the scheme I chose on the color wheel. While the complementary of this color scheme is orange-red, I slightly soften the wrinkle that comes up, and out from the side, at the end of the nose, towards the center, between the two eyebrows, and begin to lighten the area, where the edge of this wrinkle faces the light. I also lighten the small area of the upper eyelid, on the right where the light falls. These light half-valued hues are complementary color mixes, that almost cancel each other out, predominating a warm color mixed with white. For the small highlights in these areas, I add more white to the same mix but, cool it down with very little ultramarine blue. This turns the hue towards a very light green hue. Now, I take care of the light half-value area, next to the nose, where I first deposit some paint lighter than what is needed, and then, mix it with the brush in some places with the value a little darker, that is already underneath. I control this darkening manipulation of the value, with subtle brush pressure. I stop when it gets as dark as the value I need. I keep working the half-value wrinkle line, that comes down between the eye, and the nose. Parallel to this wrinkle, the skin rises, where the light falls. Here I thicken the paint a bit, and deposit a light value, cooler hue. always looking at my image intensely in the mirror, and in the place where I want to work the painting, 
I go back to the wrinkle, and increase the highlight in that area. I don't use small brushes for this purpose, as I like to maintain a certain looseness in the forms. With small brushes, the artist feels enslaved towards making more defined details. Of course, it all depends on the look you want to achieve. I continue to work the side of the nose, with a cooler hue than, its front plane. I deposit a light value amount of paint and then, move it with little pressure of the brush against the darker, and warmer paint that lies underneath. This creates some subtle contrasts, and some texture that add quality to the painting. While I manipulate the paint, I am evaluating where the half values, and lighter values should be. I adjust some edges, between the highlights, and half values, around the eye to harmonize with the rest of the painting. I return to the side, and below the nose, with a bit of light value. Then, I darken the part under the nose a little, repeating the cool, and greenish hue because here, the light does not come from the front, but from the side. I see that the value, under the brim of the hat, where the light falls, looks too light. I darken it a little, repeating the cool greenish hue. I go back to the side of the nose, and lighten a small area and then, Use the same light value on the border, above the upper lip. Notice, how you can make small light valued brush strokes, by carefully handling the tip of a medium or large brush. It takes a little practice with a top quality brush. Although, the ears are further away than, the side of the head, they are usually seen with a warmer hue. Very often the shapes of the ears should be subordinate to the shapes of the eyes, nose and mouth. This follows the principle of hierarchy. I apply orange paint, that is, a warm color on the edge of the ear. This mixture is made up of a small amount of cadmium red, yellow ochre, 
white, and a little ultramarine blue. The skill of mixing colors is acquired when you realize that, to obtain a certain hue you need as much of this color, as much of this other color, and thus, you realize that some colors have more tinting power than others. In other words, they dominate other colors easily. So it won't take long for you to know, that cadmium red, and thalo blue are strong colors, and you should be thoughtful with their amount, when you mix them with other colors. While cadmium yellow and yellow ochre are weaker. Simply paint the hair as a dark, or half value mass, based on its local value. Then, paint the large shapes, and the most prominent strands or portions of the hair. See the hair as part of the head, and the way the light shines on it. Add some highlights but, don't try to paint every strand of hair on the head. Limit details, as these break the unity of the entire head. I see the hair, a little darker under the hat, and also see that the lower part of the ear catches more light. I add a little more white to the mix on my palette, and lighten the value of the lower part of the ear. I continue to work the ear with lighter values in some places where the light falls. Now, I see that I need to lighten the tone a bit more, where the light illuminates the temple, because the hat does not block the light in this area. Here, the topography goes back so, I have to also paint this side with a color of cool temperature. That is, with a greenish hue, which is part of my concept and color scheme. On the contrary, as the skin turns to the front, it acquires a warmer temperature color. The lighter values lie near the eye. Note, that whenever I look at a place on the topography of the face, I am thinking in terms of its value and hue as well as the angle of the plane. I look at the whole face to compare the light values with others where similar values also exist. This way, I try to harmonize the whole painting by balancing its values and hues. Sometimes, I use the handle of my brush to break, or soften an edge that I see too hard. Although, there is no rule for painting the background of a portrait, we must be aware that, there is a greater amount of atmosphere between the face, and the background, due to the greater distance from the background. For this reason, the color you mix for the background should be less intense. For this purpose, I recommend lowering the intensity of these colors, either with their complementary colors, adding burnt umber, lightening with white, or a combination of methods, as needed. Remember, to harmonize the background with the face, by repeating in the background, some of the same color that you have used on the face.
Although, the background can be dark, or light valued, it should not be as dark, or as light as the values you used on your model. This is because with distance, the atmosphere grays both light and dark colors. So, any light shape in the distance looks light gray, and any black shape in the distance looks dark gray. As I said before, my concept in this painting has to do with a color scheme that includes dominant greens against some reddish hues that are complementary. In this sense, I continue to work part of the background on the left side with a low intensity dark green hue, which contrasts with the much lighter value of the face on that side. This contrast pushes the head forward and the background a certain distance to the rear. I pursue some cool hue subtleties in the folds of oblique planes, down the jawline, and near the neck. I thicken up the paint, and lighten the value a bit where the light falls directly on the cheek, preparing this area to eventually put the final highlight, with more paint and impasto. I keep working part of the front of the face, with warm hues. The frontal plane of the nose must be warmer than, its oblique plane, as this plane is moving back. Observe, the colored temperature changes, that occur in this frontal plane. Usually, you should start to cool the color from the area between the nose, and mouth to the chin. When painting each area of the face, you should carefully observe the changes in value, as well as the changes in color temperature. You have already noticed that, all the colors that I am applying in this painting belong to a predetermined color scheme. More specifically, to a scheme of variations of green hues, that dominate the variations of red hues. These light value greens, half value greens, darker greens, yellowish greens, and bluish greens occupy a larger area than, the light reds, half value reds, and darker reds. All the details that I am painting are resolved based on these variations. Whenever you paint, you should visualize the continuity of the color wheel, and keep it in mind. For example, on the color wheel, green is connected on one side with yellow, and blue on the other side. This is why, we can work from green to both yellowish green, and bluish green, which are analogous colors. In this sense, it is possible that the reddish hues, that we use are orange red or violet red. This color scheme helps to create harmony in the painting. Of course, this is not the only way to achieve harmony. It also helps, by creating edges between both temperatures, texture in places where the light hits directly, introducing some cool hues, or warm ones and creating an arrangement of hues, of greater and less intensity in the appropriate places.
with the same green hue, and a bit of burnt umber, I work more subtly the wrinkle under the eye. It looks a bit darker, and more defined near the eye. The wrinkle becomes lighter, and less pronounced as it goes down. As its value lightens, I use less burnt umber, until the green disappears, as it gets closer to the warm, reddish area. Here, I create a soft edge. Now, I take a closer look at the side of the nose, and see some areas with cooler and lighter hues. I want a bit of texture there, to break up the monotony of a single hue. I take a general look at the face, and soften several places with light values to continue relating some areas to others. In other words, all these areas belong to the same topography, only that, some are closer, and others are further away. I work the areas of the nose where I see warmer hues. I selectively move some light paint to the side, where the light falls, while I leave the darker values where the surface of the nose turns towards the local shadow. It is important that, once you establish your local shadow, you don't proceed to lighten it, with hues that belong in the light side. Doing so, means damaging the structure of your painting. The edge that separates the light from the shadow above the nose, is a soft one, in which the intensity of the warm hue increases a little.
As a tonalist artist, the attitude that persists in my mind is to continue lightening some of the values, in order to increase the value contrast and thus, the volume and realism of what I want to achieve. This requires knowing when, and how to manage the amount, and size of the light-valued paint layer. Knowing when to stop is of the utmost importance. The artist has to know what he wants to achieve, otherwise he does not know, where he is going, or when his work is finished. Each of these areas requires preparation of the surface with a not so light value, before putting the final brush strokes with the lighter values. Don't be afraid to wipe down an area that hasn't turned out the way you want it to. Sometimes, it takes several attempts to achieve what you want to do with paint. You never finish learning. It's important that the ratio of the size of the hands, to the head and the rest of the body, be correct. There is no other way to achieve this, than by regularly practicing drawing. As I indicated earlier, developing this skill is absolutely necessary. You can draw or paint your own hand, in many poses, until you have mastered its proportions. Vary the light shining on your hand, from different places. Paint the light, and local shadow as well as the angles, and sizes of the fingers, in relation to the palm of your hand. You can paint your own legs and feet, while looking at them in a mirror. You can also draw, or paint the hands and feet of someone who is watching TV. You can actually draw, or paint entire figures, because most of the time people who are watching television tend to stay still. Soft edges make features blend into the whole face, and not appear disconnected. Notice, the edges that join the lips to the adjacent skin. The warm, reddish hue of the lips meets the not-so-warm hue, of the adjacent skin, at an edge that brings them together in a soft way. The same goes for the mustache area. Observe how, the mustache becomes part of the skin, with a soft edge. Edges like these are the key to solving many of the problems, that arise in painting.
I observe the side, where the light falls on the upper lip, and whose reddish hue has a greater intensity. It has a darker value than the lower lip but, not as dark as the value of the lips on the opposite side, where the local shadow lies. I mix this dark hue with cadmium red, and a little bit of alizarin crimson. The darker value on the left end of the lip is mixed with alizarin, and burnt umber, while the lighter value near the center of the lip is a mix of cadmium red, and white. The edges inside the lips are softer than the edges, that join the lips to their surroundings. In other words, the edge between the upper lip, and the much cooler hue, found in the mustache area is firmer. The same occurs, down on the lower lip but, with less contrast with the value of the chin. I take the opportunity to join, and soften some values around the mouth with other warmer values, without breaking up their harmony. Painting teeth in an open mouth is not difficult, if you follow the same principles of light, and shadow that we have explained. Some students view each tooth separately, rather than as a single shape. We know that certain things are white like snow, clouds, part of the eyes and teeth but, we don't paint them white because they don't look white. Don't paint the local color of things with preconceived ideas. Squint your eyes, and observe the different values and hues of the teeth. Note that even on white teeth, light and shadow are observed. Start with the dark values of the shadow and lighten them, where the light falls most directly on the teeth. Light also strikes the lower lip, and above the mouth in a similar way. The teeth should not be painted with pure white, but rather mix it with a little bit of a color. Notice, that I repeated the same orange, and blue colors, that I used on the skin, mixing them with more white. Reserve the lighter values for some highlights where the light hits the teeth and lower lip directly. Sometimes, I use the handle of a brush, sharpened with a pencil sharpener to make the highlights. Any tool is good, if it achieves the result you want. I look for opportunities to work on some details, that can improve the quality of my painting. For example, I enhance the contrast, between the dark values of the eyebrow, and the cast shadow, under the hat, against the much lighter value, that I will eventually place on the brim of the hat. Another example of increasing the drama in my painting is, by lightening the value of the hue on the eyelid of the eye, where the light falls directly. This will make a greater contrast with the dark value, that I put in the eyebrow, and under the brim of the hat.
I am interested in raising the value as much as I can in those places, where the light falls directly but, without overdoing it. These opportunities, lead me to create as much emotion as possible, due to the contrasting tones. Of course, all this has to do with my chiaroscuro concept. I observe all parts of the face, alternating my gaze between my image in the mirror, and the painting. I work all over my face, at the same time to continue maintaining harmony. I go back over some parts, to see if I can further enhance the light values with some more texture. I don't want these light values to look flat or uniform. In other words, I want some color vibration. To make small brush strokes on the lips, and around the mouth, I am using a filbert brush number 6. This brush, is a medium sized brush, and with delicate touches you can work on some details. There is a tendency for some students to use small brushes, as if they were pencils. This is based on fear, and a return to drawing, where they feel most comfortable. In order to change this habit, you must fight it, in a conscious and determined way, using medium and large brushes. By no means, does this mean that small brushes cannot be used, as they are sometimes needed for small details. However, it is important, that you approach the brush strokes in terms of planes, or masses, and not of drawing the shapes with well-defined lines. For this reason, the student should try to see the painting as a whole. As artists, the brush is our main instrument, and sometimes the brush does not behave the way we want. Mastering the brush requires a certain amount of practice. In addition to my previous suggestion on the size of the brush, you can consider my previous recommendations regarding the position of the hand, its angle, the pressure and the amount of paint in the brush. Handling of the brush is an action composed of all these factors at the same time. In order for the result of our brush stroke to look like the one we want to achieve, we need to learn to manipulate the paint. Doing this manipulation through many paintings, solving the problems that you find along the way, will eventually create your unique style. Don't worry about your style, it will come naturally. Again, with the same purpose of looking for opportunities and the light values to contrast them with the dark ones, I retouch the dark values, to emphasize the drama as much as I can. I keep working on small details that can improve the quality of my painting. It's always good, to take a general look at your painting, to detect any areas that may be out of harmony with the rest of the painting. You must know what details to include, and what details to leave out. This is where your concept becomes more important as you are the only one who knows what you want your painting to look like.
Notice how the facial features are not too delineated so, that the observer is the one who completes the painting. This adds a bit of mystery to the painting. It is never good, to finish the painting to such a degree, that the viewer cannot imagine something different. This makes the viewer want to return to see the painting. I see that, the chin needs further simplification, and proceed to soften the edges of its shapes a bit. This simplification, harmonizes with the other edges on the face. Simplicity is a characteristic of aesthetics. Too many ideas, variations of the same idea, or too many details, confuse the observer. Keep the painting simple. To simplify what you are seeing, you need to be selective. This selection process, pursues the idea, that you should have about what you are painting, your concept. And this idea, has to go beyond copying what you are seeing, because if you include everything that you can see, then the painting becomes something impersonal, with no particular interest. In other words, the selection process is your way of looking at things, and this requires some creativity, discernment, and empathy with what you are seeing. It seems complicated but, in reality it is not because, it has to do with the elements that you like the most. Examples of these concepts could be, the way the light falls on the shapes, a particular color scheme, a certain amount of air, or atmosphere, a certain amount of texture on the shapes, a type of edge, or amount of contrast between the light, and the shadow. It can be any other effect that impresses you. We all have our preferences. In this sense, knowing yourself is the most important thing. One way to find out your preferences is, by visiting museums and cultivating your taste for those paintings that most attract your attention. Try to determine the common elements, of the paintings you like, as these will indicate your preferences. Note, that these concepts are abstract in nature. It is important, not to confuse these visual concepts with the subject, or the things in the paintings, which could be portraits, landscapes, still life, seascapes and others. You may have noticed that, the divisions of values and colors that I have been explaining since the beginning of this course, do not really exist. All values and colors are a continuity. I have used these graded divisions as an intermediate teaching resource, to lead you toward an abstract thinking, that is fluid and loose. This introduces you to a feeling, or experience that is acquired with the constant practice of painting. Eventually, you should see the values and colors as a continuity, and not as specific grades, or levels. While, mastering the color wheel, let yourself be guided by your instinct, in order to see the shape, or topography of the model, and determine its color temperature, value and hue. Develop this habit, and very soon, you will feel comfortable as you mix each paint, and apply it to the corresponding shape. 
This way you can paint anything that is in front of your eyes, and not just something in particular. The clothing of a model should generally not attract more attention than the face. In other words, when painting your model's clothes, you must be careful not to overdo the intensity of the colors, the contrasts of the values and the shapes. Notice, the shirt pocket. The color of it has not only been grayed out but, its shape is blurred, so that it does not compete with the face. The designs on clothing, hat, or cap must be subordinate to the face. Notice, that the design of the cap, is not only blurry but, it's also darker in the local shadow. The hues on the hat emphasized my color scheme, with dominant, analog greens, and complementary, reddish parts of the skin. Also, the impasto in the light of the hat, makes it look more sculptural, and aesthetic. The brim, at the front of the hat, has a firm, or hard edge so, that it looks closer to the observer. The closer the objects are, the more defined they look. Even, on the hat, the local shadow looks warmer than, its lighted side. Your progress in oil painting depends a lot on your attitude towards it. You will inevitably take pride in your progress, as the quality of your paintings increases. To continue improving, a lot of study, practice and visits to the best museums are required, in order to observe closely the great works that, the great masters have left us. Live, and enjoy the experience, of what you are painting at the moment. Play with the paint, by moving it with your brush to solve the problems you find. You should know that there is always a relationship in the painting problems you find. First, as your powers of observation sharpen, you will solve the most common problems of value, hue, and temperature. But then, these solutions will become part of more complex problems such as composition and balance. All these experiences in turn will be integrated into the solution of problems that have to do with the experimentation of your ideas. Gaining experience takes time so, don't worry about the final outcome. Oil painting is all about feeling the plasticity of the medium. Just enjoy the ride. Always remember that, the purpose is enjoyment.